Well, this, this topic that I've been given here, public spending and public goods, I guess it sounds similar to the last talk I gave to us, and so, some of you are here, but I have different, uh, different material here, different points I want to make about it. And I want to break um, public spending and public goods into two categories. One is there are subsidies, government subsidies, and then there's direct government spending, such as operating the postal service or something like that, uh, so, sometimes called government production. So the government actually runs enterprises. That's one kind of government spending. And the other kind of government spending is uh, writing checks to private institutions uh, or private individuals. Okay. And uh, I just have a number of points about e the economics of subsidies that I, that I thought I'd, I'd uh, go over here and talk about. And point number one probably don't have to emphasize this too much to, to this group, but um, you know, people need to realize that when, whenever a government spends money on anything, subsidizes anybody, what determines how the money will be spent is primarily politics. Uh, politicians who, dis who are ultimately responsible for this, after all, are, are vote maximizers. They, they want to keep their jobs just like you do, just like anybody else does. How do they keep their jobs? They want, to ma they want to maximize the number of votes they get in the next re-election campaign. That's how they keep their jobs. Therefore, every decision they make uh, will be determined by politics and not necessarily economics or justice <coughs> or anything else. Every once in a while, by accident, a political decision will seem to be econ economically wise or, or not too terribly unjust, but it's usually coincidence if that happens. Because the overwhelming thing is politics, is getting yourself reelected, uh, and so to think that a politician will not pay attention to politics in making decisions about resource allocation is to think that a dog can meow like a cat or a cat can bark like a dog. It just it just doesn't happen, and uh, and this is this is the the big mistake. Uh, you know, I think the young lady is not here. There's a young lady is, that's here at the conference. She was she she uh, flew the coop, I think. Now, but the, she's a uh, microbiologist who is in graduate school in public health. She was telling me yesterday that um, one of her professors uh, uh, thinks that uh, the private sector could not possibly handle water supply. You need government because the private sector is only interested in profits, whereas the government is only interested in the public interest. And not interested in anything else, and so this is, you know, so there are a lot of naive jerks like that in the academic world, <laughs> and uh, and that's a good example. And, and the schools of public health are among the worst. Uh, of the, if you read some of the literature on that, that comes out of there, they have some real scientists there, uh, but whenever you read them talking about uh, policy issues, they all seem to be communists. At schools of public health, but that's it's just totally naive. It's totally naive. It's that. Uh, that's not how water supply decisions would be made. They'd be made according to politics, not according to, there is no such thing as the public interest anyway. That, that suggests unanimity, okay? The, the government never does anything that benefits everybody. It's, it's not the nature of the beast. Majority rule at best benefits a majority, but not the minority who votes no. That's, that's, that's government. Okay, and, but uh, so that's point number one about you should always keep in mind about any government program. If you want to anticipate how it's going to work itself out, find out what the politics is. Okay, and point number two about government subsidies is subsidies cause rent seeking. Um, has anyone here heard this phrase, rent seeking? A couple, a couple people. Yeah, in you know, some class you may have taken. Uh, what rent seeking is is um, it's, a, it's an old phenomenon, been recognized for centuries. Modern economists call this phenomenon rent seeking, and basically what it is is lobbying or trying to influence politics to secure a wealth transfer by the state to get the government or the state to pass some sort of law or regulation that will put money in your pocket at the expense of somebody else. Protectionism, lobbying for protectionism is an act of rent seeking. 
lobbying for a, a government subsidy that, uh, by farmers is an act of, of rent seeking. Any kind of income transfer that is organized by the state, the lobbying for it is, is rent seeking. And rent, it's called rent because it's a clunky term. It should be called uh, subsidy seeking or plunder seeking. Plunder seeking would be the, a better term, I think. Coming uh, to the trough. Yeah, you know. yeah, something like that. Yeah, plunder seeking because you really are plundering your fellow citizens. If 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 we were to get a uh, a program that says every economics professor at an American university will get a check for ten thousand dollars every summer, uh, supposedly so he doesn't have to teach and he can engage in research and produce you know good for the public with the research, some, some phony baloney excuse like that, uh, we would be plundering our fellow citizens. We would just that's pure plunder, it's just money out of their pockets into our pockets. And it'll be legal. It'll be legal plunder, and that's pretty much what uh, rent seeking is about. Uh, and the reason why this is a, an, uh, um, an important economic phenomenon is that the more uh, the more the government gets involved in dispensing subsidies, and this is most of what the uh, modern democracies do is transfer payments. Uh, you know, you can you can make the case that building roads and things like that could, in theory, benefit just about everyone. It's not necessarily a transfer from one person to another, but that's a tiny part of what government does. Uh, most of what government does is transfer payments from one group to another. And so the reason why this is important is that the, the, the more transfers that take place, the more rent-seeking there is. And if people spend more and more of their time rent-seeking, seeking, seeking uh, plunder uh, at the expense of their fellow citizens, by definition, the less time they're spending actually producing goods and services. And so the opportunity cost of rent seeking is production that's foregone. They're not being productive citizens in producing more. There, there are two ways to gain wealth, after all. You can produce goods and services or better goods and services and sell them and make money that way. Or you can lobby the government to plunder your neighbor. You can get money that way, too. Uh, if you're in the mousetrap business, you can make money by producing a better mousetrap than everybody else and selling it, or you can lobby the government to ban the importation of foreign mousetraps. Either way, you'll make more money. And so, and the second, of course, would be plunder-seeking or, or rent-seeking. And, uh, and this is potentially a, uh, a very big problem for democracies because you know, the more young people who go to law school to learn to become public relations hacks as opposed to going to engineering school to learn how to manufacture things. You know, the more we, we will become a society that is focused on plundering each other and less on producing more goods and services. And uh, the economist uh, uh, Mansur Olson, who passed away a few years ago, uh, who was a public choice economist, um, he used to use the, an analogy to, to, to explain rent seeking of two sumo wrestlers uh, wrestling over the contents of a china shop. If you can imagine these two big Japanese guys in diapers, you know, the sumo wrestlers, and they're inside a china shop with all these shelves of goblets and fine china, and they're bouncing around, and everything's crashing around them, and, and the winner gets to take home whatever is left. And the winner walks out of the china shop with one teacup in his hand. That's what's but they destroy everything else. And that was his analogy to the sort of the economic ramifications of rent seeking. And that uh, if we if we spend so much time and effort trying to plunder our neighbors with politics, we're not we're not creating any new China. We're not we're not making any new China. We're, we're just tr transferring uh, in a, uh, what's, what's, what exists. And the, the potential is possibly to destroy a lot more than we walk out of the store with destroy a lot more wealth than we, we end up with. And so that's, that's another thing that, about subsidies. They lead to rent-seeking. Uh, they, the mar they make markets inefficient. One of the good aspects of, of markets is that if consumers no longer like a particular product or, uh, or service, then uh, and they quit buying it, the companies uh, making that product or service will have to switch products or go out of business. That's a good thing about the market. That if, if, the, if the automobile is invented and people decide that they want to ride automobiles instead of horses 
it's a good thing that the, the uh, buggy whip industry declines and all the resources that were used to make buggy, buggy whips are now used in, in the automobile and related industries. That's a, that's a good thing about the market. That's, when you talk about market efficiency and how markets allocate resources to their most highly valued uses, that's what we're talking about. As consumer demands shift, uh, the profit motive gives entrepreneurs the incentive to take resources out of those areas that consumers uh, are not too happy with and into those areas where consumers are happier with. But a lot of times subsidies to, to, gov to industry are aimed at slowing this whole process down. For example, now, uh, just last week uh, in the news, the government is spending um, many, many millions of dollars, I think it's even in the billions, to give money to uh, tobacco farmers because they tax the daylights out of cigarettes and the demand is finally shrinking for smoking. And so uh, to ease them out of it, supposedly, they're subsidizing tobacco farmers. And, you know, if, if that's what they know, tobacco farming will probably use some of this money to buy more acreage and uh, grow some more tobacco. I, uh, I would think some of them will do that. But, but uh, it's as though when the automobile was invented, the government subsidized the uh, buggy and buggy whip manufacturing to slow down the transition from that to the automobile. So it's what weakens markets, makes them more inefficient. I used to have a, uh, I used to have a little cartoon, a Gary Larson cartoon on my office door, that illustrated this point. It was a, uh, it was a picture of a, a caveman, who had like a lemonade stand, a little stand he was selling to them, but he wasn't selling lemonade. He was selling porcupine on a stick, and uh, there was a customer walking away from the stand, uh, pulling a quills out of his face. He was grimacing and pulling quills out of his face, and the caption said, "Early business failures." And where he tried it, didn't work out. People don't want porcupine in the stick, and, uh, and it didn't work. And so, uh, and I, I sort of uh, crossed out early business failures and wrote uh, early evidence that the market works. You know, if the consumer doesn't want porcupine in the stick, well, you won't see porcupine in the stick. But uh, a lot of government subsidies would be aimed at subsidizing the guy with the porcupine in the stick uh, booth uh, to slow down this transition. Okay. Uh, a fourth point about government subsidies is that uh, they encourage conflict. So I, guess, I guess this is the thing about politics in, in general, whereas, you know, the market is generally cooperative. If, uh, if I buy a, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out and, if I go out and buy a, a mini iPod, uh, from uh, Apple, it's totally cooperative. Apple has invested a lot of money in creating this product that I think people like. And if I buy it, trade is mutually advantageous. I'm happy to give him my $300 because I value the mini iPod at more than $300. And he's happy to take my $300 because he values the mini iPod at less than $300. Trade is mutually advantageous. It's cooperative. Great thing. Politics is always, at best, a zero-sum game. One person gains, another person loses. So when you have uh, subsidies involved, uh, government subsidies, it's always a matter of taking, robbing Peter to pay Paul, taking money out of one group of taxpayers and giving it to another group of taxpayers. And one of the, one of the great expositions of the importance of this phenomenon is uh, a book by John C. Calhoun, who Murray Rothbard thought was one of the America's greatest political philosophers, and it's called A Disquisition on Government. And Calhoun was Vice President of the United States. He was the Secretary of War for a while. He was a United States Senator from uh, South Carolina. And he wrote this book right before he died. In, in 1850, it was published. And one of the things he, uh, he wrote about was that in a democracy, he said it would inevitably evolve into a, a situation where you have tax consumers, that is, who are people who on net uh, benefited more from government spending than they paid, call them tax consumers, versus taxpayers, which are people who paid more tax than they got back in government benefits. And he, he, he predicted that any democracy would, involve, would evolve into a, a big system of conflict between the tax consumers and the taxpayers, which has certainly come true. It came true a, a lot earlier than than this year. It's been true for quite a long time. And so, uh, and that is inherently conflictual. You pretty, it's pretty much 
uh, the, uh, the tax plunderers versus the people who are trying to protect themselves from being plundered. And so uh, subsidies generate inherent conflict in society. And Calhoun was, uh, was great on that. And next point, point number one, two, three, four, I think it's point number five, is that uh, the worst liars rise to the top. The worst liars rise to the top under a regime of uh, government subsidies. And because after all, you know, I mentioned uh, in my last lecture, not everyone is here for the last lecture, but, um, you know, how can you justify uh, farm subsidies to millionaires? You know, millionaire farmers who run these large corporate farms and who might have an income of several million dollars a year, and they own tens and tens of thousands of acres of land and, and, and so forth. And yet we have farm programs that, that pay them to not grow produce, to not grow livestock. And we have per acre direct cash subsidies to farmers among the farm programs. How could you justify essentially corporate welfare for millionaires financed by the taxpayers? You have to have some sort of system of lies one big pack of lies about how you're really protecting the family farm. It's not the millionaires you're protecting. It's, it's necessary for national defense because we need to feed the army. So, so you have to have some sort of ideology of propaganda to justify this sort of thing. And the people who are at best, the best liars, the best at convincing the public that high prices are in their interest will succeed in politics. That's, that's who will get the subsidies the people who can think of the most plausible big lies. That's why the most successful politician as a politician in my lifetime has been Bill Clinton. Because he was, you know, there were stories when he was in office about his Hollywood friends actually trained him before he took office to look directly into the camera and tell a big lie without smirking or chuckling or anything like that. So he actually practiced lying on television to do what he did. And who has been more successful than Bill Clinton as a politician? And nobody I can think of in my, in my lifetime, anyway, as a politician. You know, every time you get caught molesting a young woman in the White House, his approval ratings go up. <laughs> and so, and so, uh, so he's real good, uh, uh, real good at it. And so, biting that bottom lip, all the soccer moms in the country would just their knees would go weak when he would bite that bottom. He's he's still doing it every time you see him on, te on television. And then that's all practiced. Uh, there was one famous incident of him coming out of the funeral of Ron Brown, who was the uh, 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 Secretary of Commerce who died in a plane crash. And he was laughing his ass off, laughing like crazy at some something. And then he saw a television camera, and he, he just, just like that, he got real sullen looking and, and started like a tears were coming out of his eyes. He was crying because he was coming out of a funeral. And uh, so, so who's better than that? You know, that's... And so that's why, you know, in a regime of, of uh, subsidies, government subsidies, the biggest liars rise to the top. Another aspect of subsidies, uh, I'll erase some of these. And I guess the top, you don't get more the top than President of the United States in American politics. Uh, subsidies cause moral hazard problems. Uh, I'll, I'll illustrate this. There's one particular type of subsidy. That there's a, something called a federal, um, federal disaster insurance, which includes federal flood insurance. It's, uh, the federal government subsidizes insurance so that you can buy insurance Say you uh, build a beach house on the beach in North Carolina, and if you qualify for this federally subsidized insurance, it's about one-tenth of the price you would pay for insurance on the free market, if you could find insurance on the free market, if you could find someone to sell it to you. A lot of times you can get federal insurance that uh, is not only pretty cheap, but it's the only insurance you can get. The private insurers won't sell you any insurance to build a house in, in certain places, like in the paths of hurricanes on Caribbean islands. There are some Caribbean islands where people build the uh, frame of the house in cement, basically, so that even if a hurricane, that's their insurance. So if a hurricane does come through, your house is not wiped out, you might lose your roof. 
and that's about it. But that's so your insurance is not insurance; it's building with cement and not frame. Uh, but but anyway, uh, federal flood insurance, federal disaster insurance, it creates what's called a moral hazard problem because you know, the, ostensibly the purpose of it is to protect people financially from a disaster like a hurricane or an earthquake. Okay. However, if you're subsidizing people to build ha houses in the paths of hurricanes or on earthquake faults, you're going to have more people building houses in the paths of hurricanes or on earthquake faults. You're going to encourage them to build houses in places where you know they're going to have the damage from a hurricane or an earthquake. Like burning down South Bronx. Yeah, kind of like burning down the South. That was a moral hazard problem. Walter Block mentioned the, that. That was a moral hazard problem created by a, a government program, the same phenomenon. And so, you, and so you, we see this all the time, this moral hazard problem, where you have beach houses <laughs> built right on well-known hurricane paths or on earthquake faults in California. And uh, the, the ABC News guy, John Stossel, uh, actually did a, one of his uh, specials on this. And, uh, and he actually, he, he lives in a house right on Long Island, right on the water. And there was a big, big nor'easter that went up the coast uh, one summer that wiped out his house, knocked the whole thing down, and it dumped it in the ocean. And he had his own video camera with him. And on this, it was one on ABC 2020, the Barbara Walters show. He had his uh, video camera, and he, you can see the ocean. This was after the storm passed. And he said, you see that white speck out there? That's my refrigerator on the ocean. And he, and he looked, and it was like a, the, the foundation to his house, and that was it. The whole thing was swept out in the ocean. And he said, but I'm not worried. And he said, I love living at the beach. You know, he said, I have kids, and they love playing in the beach, and I just love being in the ocean, the beach. And... Uh, and you, the taxpayers, are going to pay to rebuild my house. Thank you very much. He's, he's saying, on, you know, very tongue-in-cheek. But it was true. He had federal flood insurance, which is very cheap, uh, you know, very inexpensive, and he was covered. And so why not rebuild? If you want to live on the beach, why not? If somebody else is willing to pay. But if he were to go to Lloyd's of London and pay the free market price, he'd probably be living inland because he wouldn't want to pay that, you know, whatever they would charge, $100,000 a year or whatever they would charge. To uh, to ensure against uh, you know living in a path of a hurricane well, like that, it was twenty percent. Twenty percent of the value of your home, or per year. Per so year, it was yeah. a total wipeout. Yeah. So if he had a million dollar house right on that spot, it'd be two hundred thousand a year that he'd be paying it. So, so, every, so year, every year he gets every, a new carpet in his basement. Every year they remodel his basement because every year there's flooding. In, in <laughs> probably, yeah, depending on what his deductible is, I guess. Uh, yeah, he would. Uh, yeah, if there's flooding in there from just the normal storms, uh, he'd, he'd get that at the taxpayer's expense. <coughs> taxpayer's expense. So that's you know, that's a moral hazard problem. The most, uh, the best known example of a moral hazard problem is uh, the effects of welfare. And there's always been a the problem with welfare is on the one hand, in theory, it was always intended. Uh, I think it was President Kennedy in the United States that uh, came up with the slogan of uh, the purpose of welfare is a a hand and not a handout. I think it was Kennedy. I'm not sure. Maybe it was Johnson. But it might have been Johnson that said that. Said that. Uh, um, and so, and, and, you know, people have always referred to welfare. The purpose of welfare is uh, uh, teaching a person to fish and not giving him a fish, uh, you know, helping people out, it's slogans like that. But the problem has always been recognized for a long time that on the one hand, you know, people could be in favor of uh, welfare payments for uh, lower income people of, of, of a certain level. But on the other hand, you don't want to make it so generous that you pay people essentially not to work. And so uh, what you would do is if you pay people enough so that they can get along pretty well uh, on welfare, you destroy their work ethic because they're not working. And uh, you actually make them worse off because, you know, in theory, the purpose is supposed to be to make people uh, someday be financially independent, like everybody else, and get a job and in the, in the not be dependent. But if it's generous enough, you make them do the opposite, not get a job. Um, a, a good example of this is uh, there was a, a, a housing program that was the brainchild of Jack Kemp when he was the uh, secretary of HUD, Housing and Urban Development. And he called it Move to Opportunity. And it was a housing subsidy where 
they would give people who qualified for public housing cash instead of a subsidized public housing. Instead of living in a public housing where you might pay a pittance, a hundred dollars a month or something, and the rest of it is paid for with uh, federal subsidies, they just write you, give you a cash. And uh, in the state of Maryland where I live, they, they had different rules for different states. In the state of Maryland where I live, it would be up to seventeen hundred dollars a month in, some, in like Prince George's County, which is the, one of the counties that borders Washington D.C. But to qualify, you had to be uh, 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 you had to have below the poverty level. You could earn some income, but you had to be below seventeen thousand six hundred uh, some income. You had to be below that. You, you you had to be not married, and you had to have uh, no more savings than I think five hundred dollars in the bank. <coughs> or some limit of savings. So the three things that are necessary to get out of poverty, like if you were to look at people who have a job and stick with it, people who get married and stay married, number two, and three, people who have some savings, you'd be hard pressed to find anybody in America who's poor who does those three things. And so the three things that are most closely linked to not being poor or the requirement to qualify for a, for a free $1,700 a month house. And you can get some damn good housing in Prince George's County, Maryland for $1,700 a month. It's not, it's not that expensive a place to live. And so there are some neighborhoods there where that's, you, could, you could live in a big five-bedroom house on a couple of acres for, uh, for that kind of money uh, up there. And at the same time, they had hardworking middle-class people who could never afford a $1,700 a month mortgage. But they're paying the tax for these people who uh, who are uh, qualifying for this program, and so, you know, if I were a person like this, then and they told me you can live in a uh, five-bedroom, thirty-five hundred square foot house on two acres for free, as long as you don't save your money and don't get married and don't make much, it'd be pretty tough for me to decide to get to get a, a decent job and go to work every day and start saving my money and. Uh, and, and all that, and so, so you create the very conditions that will perpetuate poverty with this anti-poverty program, so-called anti-poverty program. That's that's uh, that's another example of moral moral hazard. Unemployment insurance, unemployment insurance uh, encourages people to remain unemployed as long as possible because you pay them, you pay them sixty percent of what they could make on average in the United States. And so, uh, so you encourage people to stay unemployed. Okay, that, that's what I wanted to say about subsidies, some of the economics of subsidies and about the, the incentive effects. Subsidies create incentives. It's not enough to just declare your good intentions with, with subsidies. Um, the government production is a little different. When government runs an enterprise, and uh, maybe I'll use my uh, grocery store example to explain government production. And I have, a, I have a plan to reorganize the American grocery industry. And here's, here's what I'd like, I would like to do to reorganize the American grocery industry. Uh, we would assign everyone to a neighborhood store. And that is, if, if you lived right here, if you lived in these condos behind uh, the Mises Institute, you would be you would be given a grocery store, whatever, whatever the closest one. That's there's a Kroger's up the road. That's where you shop. Free groceries for all. Just like free public schools, free public library, free groceries. After all, how can you educate yourself in the free public schools if you have an empty stomach? And the argument will be made. So you need free groceries too. Uh, not not totally free. I'll put quotation marks on free because we we will finance um, uh, a gro these through a grocery tax. Of I'll just make this up. Say three thousand dollars per year. So the way it works is. Uh, uh, there will be a grocery tax, at least to those who qualify for this tax, not the poor, but the people who uh, qualify for it. Three thousand dollars a year. You pay your grocery tax, and then you can walk into your grocery at any time and take whatever you want. So it's not totally free; it's just paid for in advance, or you pay the tax, and then then. But everything is zero priced inside the store. 
take whatever you want. Okay, every every employee in the same seniority is paid the same. So if you're in the if you work in the meat counter and you have three years seniority, you're paid the same as somebody who's at the checkout counter with three years seniority. Okay, everybody's paid the same. No, no differentiation. If the food rots, that requires a tax increase. After all, it is tax finance with this three thousand dollar year tax. So, if uh, if the stores are managed badly and they let the meat rot and the, the vegetables rot and, uh, and, and so forth, well, we're going to have to raise taxes. People have to eat. You can't let people starve. So we'll have to raise taxes. And then uh, a campaign of demonization you can't really see that. I've kind of covered it up there. It says campaign of demonization against uh, opponents of the tax increase. If you uh, if people who oppose a tax increase, I think it would be uh, since food is so important, it would be legitimate to claim that they they're in favor of starving children, and so uh, and so uh, so I think that would be a legitimate thing to do because after all, children can't go to school on empty stomachs, and if the food rots, you need food, and so and so who could object to raising taxes for more food for children? So you're you're in favor of starving children if you're against uh, the tax increase, and. Um, um, you can uh, you, you have to pay double to shop. That is, you're assigned you're, you'll be assigned to your neighborhood grocery store, and you can only shop there with your three thousand dollar a year. You just show them your card that you're paid up, and you can take whatever you want. And uh, however, if you want to go to a gourmet deli or something, you can go there, but you have to pay. You can go and pay. So you end up paying double. You pay your tax, and you have to pay. You pay some price for whatever you buy at the gourmet deli, so you're not, and that would probably restrict it to the more affluent. You know, the lower income people might have a tough time coming up with a three thousand, let alone uh, you know shopping at, at gourmet delis and all that. Okay, um, that's enough for now. This is my restructuring of the grocery industry. So, uh, what would you expect? How would you expect an industry like this to be run in terms of efficiency, responsiveness to the consumer? You have to work the meat kind of get a steak. I'll go say yeah, no, meat, well, no steaks anymore. Why not? Because I first thing I'll do is get them the steak. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah it, well, well, I, well, I guarantee you, my dog would eat filet mignon every night. Why? It would be cruelty to animals to feed a dog with stinky old dog food when I could give filet mignon every night if, if it really was zero price. Well that, well, that of course is what happens whenever the government runs anything: schools, water supply. Whatever, if it puts a zero explicit price on the thing, its, it's natural proclivity is gross overuse, which causes shortages. So there's, like you said, in the meat kind, they'd be, they'd be, so they'd have to be raising taxes all the time, not because the food goes rotten, because, because you create a situation of unlimited demand, but with limited supply, whenever you have a zero explicit price, uh, as far as that goes. So that might be a problem, but I'll work on it. I think I'm smart enough to figure this out, uh, a way out of this. Uh, what else would you expect to happen? You'll be in line. I'll be in line out the door. And if I call oh, yeah. the store for a call on the phone, it'll always be busy. Well, that's probably true. Yeah, that's another another aspect of every government agency. If you create shortages, there's going to be a, a queue. There's going to be lines. Certainly with this one, there'd be lines. Um, you know, next for rent seeking for sure. You know, after one year, they'll increase the tax, increase, 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 because there will be short of uh, food supply. Yeah, there'll be a lot of people complaining that they, 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 didn't, they were at the end of the line and didn't get their, their share because my dog ate all their, their steak, I guess. Uh, you have lots of bribery from, from Well Connected. Basically, you get to try and come to, uh, in contact with the seniority that has the ability to get a hold of these steaks that are in shortage. And uh, soon enough, you'll have a little black market yeah. uh, under the table. Uh, yeah, that's, that's what I would expect. Uh, you know, whenever there's a shortage, uh, not everybody is created equal. 
uh, with shortages, then the, the, the more affluent are better able to bribe their way around. And um, the classic example is uh, that economists always use is uh, uh, rent control, where rent control causes shortages of housing. But in New York City, for decades and decades, they've had something called key money, where uh, a landlord will say, well, this rent control department is going for $300 a month, next to nothing. Give me $10,000 and you can have the key. And so it's a way around it. So if you have $10,000, you can get the, 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 uh, the short supply of, of housing, or in the case of the stake, if you have enough money to bribe, you'll get it. I remember in the 1970s when we had uh, price controls on gasoline, there was all kind of bribery going on to get gasoline. It's like there's people bribing their way through the line or with the station owner to get the short supply of gasoline. If you're poor and you don't have the bribe money, you're just out of luck. You just go without. And uh, what else? What? To a grocery store in the inner city. What's that? You don't want to go to a grocery store in the inner city. Why not? Yeah, well, that, that would probably be a manifestation of the bribery of the more affluent, I guess. That they would um, bribe whoever's running this to, to make sure that the better quality stuff gets in their neighborhood. And not uh, uh, and poor people uh, are usually not as good at playing politics as rich people, so they wouldn't uh, wouldn't be as effective. But so have all the lazy employees who are just waiting for their uh, increase of, of income. How cynical. How, how cynical. <laughs> they wouldn't be interested in serving the public interest and... They just and serve, they're just put, doing their time to add uh, their... Yeah, well, yeah, if they are paid the same, I guess that, that always means if you have somebody who's a great employee, shows up every day, does a great job, and gets paid the same as every lazy bum that's there. Well, what's the use? What's, uh, what's the use? So the way I maybe maybe I should rethink that then. If I uh, if I just, every every employee is paid the same. Uh, oh yeah, I forgot to put that uh, we would give employees lifetime tenure. Also, uh, we would not uh, make it. We would make it through civil service rules. We would make it impossible to fire anybody for uh, for any reason other than uh, criminal behavior. Maybe maybe if they killed a coworker. Maybe, uh, all the skilled employees would end up leaving and going to work for the pay double the shop stores because there they'd be paid uh, not according to their uh, seniority but according to their ability. Okay, so you'd be left with all the slugs at the uh, at these stores. Maybe I should rethink that too. But I if pay double the shop. <laughs> the store will look mm. terrible. I mean, you'll be mm. waiting in line when you finally get in. The shelves will be empty. The, the employees are surly, and and the place looks a mess. What makes you think that? Hadn't been clean. Mm -hmm. Because there's no uh, no reason to, to change it. You, you're okay. Assigned to that store. Okay, so you have a captured audience of customers and a guaranteed income uh, with tax increases. I guess I guess you're right that if if the store looked like crap with uh, ten day old spoiled milk on the floor, why bother? Was that? It would be a Canadian hospital. A Canadian hospital. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Canadian hospital. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was you want to say, to say uh, building on what Michael was saying about the good quality people leaving, well, uh, you have the effect that you were saying with the worst liar, liars rising on the top, basically Peter principled organization where all you have left is just a bunch of nepotistic guys that keep on moving up the ranks. Okay, yeah, that's what you'd have. Uh, anything else? So this is very disappointing. I was hoping that I could uh, reorganize the entire American grocery industry along these lines. Um, well, uh, yeah. Everyone would try to get their 3,000 worth a year and they get stuff whether they want it or not. So just pay a lot more waste. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's why I said my uh, my dog would eat steak every night, uh, most nights anyway. There, uh, there'd be yeah. an incentive on the part of the um, the person who runs this program, the, the higher up people, to make it run as inefficiently as possible. Because the more inefficient it is, the more taxes they get, which means the more political power they have. If they ran yeah. it efficiently, they wouldn't need a lot of taxes, and they'd be a relatively small program compared yeah. to other government programs. Yeah, one of the features of any government bureaucrat, assume, assuming you have a government employee running this, is that uh, in order to move up and run, maybe be the state grocery commissioner, uh, how do you do that? Well, you have to prove that you're able to run a large bureaucracy. So there's a built-in incentive to have overstaffing and have, be an empire builder so that you can prove that you can run a big empire so that you can move up to running an even bigger empire at the state level or something like that. 
And so you would have, you, I would expect you'd have uh, the manager hiring a lot of people he doesn't really need to have, but it, it, it makes him look good or her look good because they, they're running a big empire. And so, and you need tax dollars for that. You need to raise taxes to hire more and more people for that. So uh, you might have, you might only need one butcher back there, but you might have 10 anyway uh, at, the, at, the, at the butcher counter. You might have 50 checkout counters, but you're not, nobody pays anything. So what, all they have to do is show their card, their tax card, and you might have something like that. Okay, well, maybe I'll rethink all this. But what, what, what industry in America is run exactly like this? Public schools. Yeah, public schools. If you, were to, uh, if you were to substitute the word uh, schools for grocery, this is exactly how the American public schools. In fact, every government, every government enterprise is run just like this. It's a monopoly, uh, you know, a more or less captured audience. If, you're, if it's a government-run monopoly, you have to pay taxes for it, even if you don't want it. If there's a, at least a, if there's a private monopoly, it was a genuine monopoly, sole supplier of some good, you can always say, no thanks, I don't want that good at all. You know, even though you're a monopoly, you don't have to pay for it. But when the government runs a monopoly, you have to pay for it. You have to pay taxes. They can put you in jail if you don't pay your taxes. So it's, uh, it's even worse yet. Uh, they, will no, they will not use a lot of capital and there will be no innovation over time. Well, yeah, there's no, there's no profit motive. So innovation that uh, pleases customers brings more profit in in a, in a real private sector, but there's no profit in the government sector, so why bother? And so uh, there won't be any innovation. It'll look, it'll look like the same 30 years from now, the technology will be the same as it is now, uh, or worse, uh, the existing technology would, would run out. So I did this in a class one, one time, and I had a, a young guy from Taiwan who uh, was sitting there, and I asked, uh, it was undergraduate class, and he asked, I asked, well, what does this look like? And he said, communism. And that was pretty much true. That's <laughs> government-run monopoly. So, so when you have a government enterprise run as a government monopoly, these are all things that you, you have. You have all, all these things that everybody said, all these consequences, and it's, uh, and, and it's, and it's built in. It's, a, it's inherent in, in, the, in the structure of the incentive that you create. It's not that the people running it are necessarily evil or lazy, but these are the incentives you're going to create to anybody. Okay. Um, yeah, what, with regard to shortages, government enterprises are always creating shortages of some kind or another. A good example in, uh, in my state of Maryland, so, a few years ago we had a drought where it, it didn't rain for about nine or ten months, it no rain at all, and everybody's yard was about the color of these tables. And, uh, and about several years prior to that, the state government had uh, spent huge amounts of money, hundreds of millions, building some big reservoirs in the, in the uh, western part of the state of Maryland to, to have water, a water supply, in case there's a drought. But then the environmentalists sued the state by saying if they started using some of the water and dried up, you know, the water level went down in some of these lakes, then there are all sorts of bugs and little critters who live there who might be harmed. Therefore, you shouldn't. So we have these big lakes now that, were, that the taxpayers spent hundreds of millions of dollars on that can't be used to alleviate droughts. But, uh, you know, if the private sector handled the water supply and not the, the state, uh, you would never have any such problem because they would price it at market prices. The problem with the, with the state is that politicians always want to make themselves popular by pricing way below cost and then subsidizing the enterprise through general revenues. That's a way of hiding the cost to the taxpayers of running this whole operation. And of course, whenever you price, you don't have to price zero, like in my example, when you price things cheaply, cheaper than they otherwise would be, you stimulate the amount demanded and, uh, and you create shortages when you have price controls. So generally water supply that's run by governments suffers always from, from uh, uh, shortages. And that's what we had in, uh, in, uh, in Maryland. And then uh, once we had the shortage that was created by the state, the state put regulations in that uh, you couldn't, uh, couldn't wash your car or you couldn't, uh, you couldn't water your garden or flowers or anything like that. And they actually had awards and penalties. They had, there was like a $1,000 fine if you were caught watering your flowers. 
and they actually had a, a rewards for people who would turn their neighbors in. If you get up in the morning and you see your, your neighbor sneaking a, a watering bucket into his flowers, and people were reporting their neighbors all over the place. You listen to the morning news, and there'd be somebody on his work, and they'd notice somebody with a hose in their hand, and they would take down the address, and some bureaucrat, Gestapo, would show up and, and uh, write them up uh, a warning. I think they gave you one warning, and the second time you had the $1,000 fine on this. And, but if, if the free market ran the water supply, this would never happen. It would be, uh, they would price according to free market principles and you wouldn't have, wouldn't have shortages uh, at all. Let's see. Um, another a myth about government enterprises is the myth of business-like government. This is a pretty good one. The myth of business-like government. You hear this all the time that from politicians who say, I'm, I'm going to run this enterprise like a business uh, a good example in the U.S. is uh, uh, I lived in Tennessee for a while, and the Tennessee Valley Authority hired the former head of uh, Nissan, uh, Marvin Runyon, to head that. He, he, he went on to run the U.S. Postal Service after this. But he was a, an automobile executive at uh, Ford or General Motors, one of the American car companies. Then he was the CEO of Nissan in America. They have plants in, in the U.S., and then he was the head of the Tennessee Valley Authority, and he made a big deal of, since he came from the private sector of we're going to run the TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority, which is, runs a, a series of dams and produces electric power and nuclear power uh, like a business. And, uh, and he did a lot of things to make it look like a business. He had a board of directors. He had board meetings and so, so forth. So it looked kind of like it looks like a business what it would look like. But um, the fatal flaw in the whole argument, though, is that any government enterprise that is capitalized with tax dollars could, not, could never possibly be run like a business. You know, businesses are not capitalized, real business is not capitalized by, uh, by subsidies from taxpayers. And so, uh, you know, real businesses are uh, capitalized by uh, money that's invested by people who have a stake in it, either the owners in a proprietorship or stockholders. And so, you know, if you don't have uh, stock market discipline or the discipline of owners who have their own money invested in it, you don't have a business. You have, you have a government enterprise. And so that's really a myth of uh, a myth that the government could ever be business-like. You can make some transparent changes to make it look like a business, but not really. And uh, for that basic reason, you know, how many real businesses have their facilities paid for by uh, the taxpayers? Um, nor is there any no, no, there's no competition there. That's another thing about government enterprises. They're, they're usually government monopolies by law. It's usually illegal to, to compete with enterprises like that. And even if it's not illegal, they, they can, they can uh, crowd out of the market any private competitors because of the advantages they have. They're tax exempt, for one thing, and they get government subsidies to pay for their inf infrastructure. And it's hard to compete with that. Even Duke Power could conceivably compete with uh, the TVA. I think it actually does in some some markets, but it's at a great disadvantage because it has to raise funds from investors and it has to pay taxes, and the TVA does not. The TVA is even uh, exempted from a lot of environmental regulations. They can pollute like crazy and, uh, and not bear the consequences of uh, of uh, pollution as much as a private corporation would. They did the same same sort of thing. So that's sort of unfair competition. Uh, another myth is that, or another point of confusion is government spending is often referred to as investment. Bill Clinton was real big on this. It drove me crazy when he would, he would advocate uh, building more public housing slums and call it an investment. They, call it, uh, they wouldn't even call it a, what's that? Tony Blair always does it. Oh, yeah. Watch, oh, yeah. He's always talking about we need to invest in... Yeah. yeah, but it's not. It's consumption. It's consumption spending. It's not investment. The, econo the proper economic term is consumption and spending. Call it investment. But but it's because it, that's what it is. It's not, it's not somebody investing their money in some program, some project, some business with hopes that they'll be producing something in the future. It's just spending on, on housing or whatever they're, they're spending on. And... Uh, and besides, the, the uh, government does try to invest, though. So there are government programs that tinker with various investments in, uh, in, uh, in businesses, like the Tennessee Valley Authority. They invest. They build plants, nuclear plants, and so forth. That's sort of an investment. 
But the incentives are totally different in, in politics. Uh, remember, like rule number one was politics always prevails uh, whenever the government is involved in allocating resources. And so ask yourself this question. If, um, if it was uh, 1978 and you were on a congressional committee that was uh, put in charge of allocating a big bunch of money, millions and millions of dollars, to the brand new, the newly emerging computer industry in America. The personal computer industry was just becoming to, into being in the late 70s, early 80s. And these are the choices that you had of where to spend this, this big bunch of money. Uh, one, IBM. Two, the company in a company in Danny Rostenkowski's congressional district. Danny Rostenkowski at the time, I think, was, uh, or maybe he wasn't quite there yet. Uh, well, let's assume he was there. He was the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, so he's the most powerful member of Congress. Or six Harvard dropouts hanging out Six Harvard dropouts hanging out in Bill Gates' dad's garage. Uh, you know, where would you invest the money if you were a member of Congress who was given a billion dollars to allocate to the, the, the emerging personal computer industry? Well, I guarantee you it would go to these two, but not to the six dropouts uh, out there. Because politics always rules. And, uh, but if you were a private capital, venture capitalist, what you would do is you would, you would sit there and you would have people from IBM make a, a, present you with a business plan. If you want me to give you a billion dollars, or lend you a billion dollars, what's your business plan? What's your product? What's your business plan? The same with this company. What's your business plan? And then Bill Gates, what's your business plan? And of course, I would bet in that case, Bill Gates would have got the money, and which he did, of course. He, he did find investors for, for Microsoft in the, out there. And, uh, I think I mentioned in my talk, one of my talks yesterday, that on the uh, on Lou Rockwell's website, there was this uh, famous photograph of Gates and his the co-founders of Microsoft in '78 or something like that, and they, they all looked like a bunch of uh, 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 University of California Berkeley 1960s potheads in the long hair, and Bill Gates looked like he was five years old in the picture, <laughs> looked like a little kid, but uh, you know they're computer geniuses that started this company up. So whenever whenever government pretends to invest money, um, that's what it, uh, politics will prevail. It won't, it's not all the same. With, with the private investors, uh, uh, if they guess right, they stand to profit. If they guess wrong, they lose. They're what we call residual claimants. Uh, when when the government uh, quote invests money, if it invests money in a bad idea, what does it do? It puts more money behind the bad idea because it, it's embarrassing to fail behind the bad idea. It's, it's, well, if you can call this uh, De Lorenzo's Law, in government, failure is success. Whenever the government fails at something, it always ends up giving itself more money to do that thing. So financially, failure is always success in government, uh, whereas in the private sector, it's just the opposite. If you fail and consumers don't like your product, you fail, you go bankrupt. Um, the final thing I'll mention here about government spending is uh, governments always make sure that they control what Murray Rothbard called the command posts of society. In terms of what government spends its money on and runs, it always makes sure it controls the police and the military, that's never private, the judicial system, so that it can put you in jail whenever it wants, the monetary system, rivers and coastal areas, it always you know, I'd like to live on the ocean like John Stossel, but if you look at a map of the East Coast of the United States, all the nicest places are dominated by military bases. All the nice, all the, not all of them, but so much, there's so much real estate that uh, there's military bases that will be, you know, ripe for development. Uh, streets and highways, 
post office, education, all these things, the command posts of society are always dominated by. They want to be able to brainwash people with education, the mails so they can censor what, what they need to censor, streets and highways, they want to control our mobility, the same with coastal areas and rivers, and of course the monetary system. They want to be able to manipulate the economy if they can, to the best they can with the monetary system. So, uh, so that's the other feature of uh, government spending that I would mention. And we have a few minutes left over if anybody has comments, questions. Declarations you'd like to make? Uh, you mentioned the point that the government works for politics and not the public interest. Yeah. If the government were to work for the majority of the public interest, why wouldn't a satisfied public in vote for that government? Um, well, a majority would. Uh, if you had pure majority rule, uh, you, you might make uh, that where the government did uh, satisfy the majority, you would satisfy the majority. But uh, sure, they would keep them in. But then uh, you'd always have what we call political externalities. If 51% think the government is working well and they like it, uh, and 49% don't, uh, for one thing, you don't, you don't know anything about the intensity of preferences. Maybe the 51% think, well, it's doing a pretty good job, and, and, but the 49% are outraged over the awful job that the government is doing. Uh, you know, you have, we have no way of measuring that. But it's still, at, at the very best, the government, uh, uh, if, if it did satisfy a majority in, under a democracy, that's, that's all you can say, it would satisfy the majority, and, uh, but only by harming the minority, the minority that, uh, that is uh, unhappy with, with what it is doing. That's just the nature of democracy. It's, um, the, the buzzword that economists use is political externalities. The people who don't get their way um, are, are put upon with an, with an externality. I don't know if does that answer your question? I don't know uh, what. So, but of course, this is, you know, government is never, governments don't operate well. That's, it's not the government's nature to, to run anything well. It, it doesn't. I think with that system, there is an inherent sluggishness in response of any demand that you're talking about to the government. It literally takes years. Uh, to respond to some request like this, whereas the, the federal, the free market can quickly switch over to other systems when it doesn't work. The uh, best example of that is uh, the Internet. When it was first done by the government, it was slumped. You know, when the free market came, it quickly changed itself. Is that real milk and long uh, advocation of, of pressure funds is poorly done. Best example I know, even though it's either heavily subsidized or even free. Every single day you look out here and you have these empty buses running around. One of the <laughs> Auburn uh, Amtrak. Tiger thing, and there's this lead thing. Look, there's nobody there, maybe two people. The amount of mill wrong uh, assignment for this fund is just it's terrible. This would never happen. Yeah, there's, there's no uh, consumer nexus with government. And so all the things we get from government, you know, so much of it, Nobody wants. I mean, it's, there are said to be public good. You're taught in school that there's this public goods problem where uh, people are too selfish to contribute adequate amounts of money to provide all these things the government gives us. But uh, but most of these things you see government does, nobody wants anyway. There's no public goods and problem. There's no free rider problem. People in, yeah. people are not dying to get into these crappy buses that run around town here. The, and the, they're just too stingy to pay for them. That's 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 ridiculous to think. I think that that's true, but the, the the way I think the right way to look at uh, democracy is, uh, is 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 uh, is as one organized gang that gets together and is able to rob a smaller gang. Uh, if uh, let's say if you and I are walking down the street and we see Dr. Prince's car, and he drives a big Mercedes, let's say, and, and you and I would like to have that Mercedes and own it for us, and uh, and so we break the window and we start uh, starting up the car. And Dr. Prince comes upon us and says, hold on a minute there. That's my car. And we say, well, we believe in democracy. Let's see who owns the car. Let's take a vote. And you and I vote, it's our car. He votes, it's his car. We outvote him. Sorry, Dr. Prince, it's our car. So that's, that's basically democracy. You know, the, the majority mob votes itself other people's money. And, the, and if you're in the minority, tough luck. You know, you, you've been robbed legally. Uh, fair and square, and that's basically what we're, so. Even if even if government were to work perfectly efficiently, we don't want that. We want it to be sloppy. Actually, 
if it, if, because if it's perfectly efficiently, it means it's more efficient at robbery. And then we wouldn't want that. We want it to be slow and sluggish. And that's, that's, that was the thinking of the American founding fathers. That's why they had the system of checks and balances. That's why they strictly limited the, the powers that the central government would be given. That's why they, they tried to make it as hard as they could think of to get laws passed. Uh, because they understood democracy was inherently a system of organized robbery, but you need some democracy to avoid being a uh, a, a, a monarchy. They didn't want it to be a monarchy, but but uh, that was also their big mistake too. I think uh, to think that government could be limited. Okay, so, the the state, for example, the army the police. Uh, is there a danger of uh, having the they don't have money to have control over the ones that don't have money. Is that is there a danger of the same danger that is the majority over minority? Uh, of having of having what now? If we privatize the uh, police law system and everything. Um, if we privatize the police, is there a danger of what? I'm not in. Is there a danger of people who have? Uh, or financing the, post, the private police uh, having take control over the minority who don't have money. So. Sort of like they do now, I guess. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Ask people, ask black people in Los Angeles what they think of the police taking advantage of the poor people. Yeah. Uh, that, that happens now. And uh, uh, well, you know, it's 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 one of these things where. Um, you know, this requires some research. There's a, a guy named uh, Ed Stringham who teaches at San Jose State. He was, he's been here. He was a student of Walter Block's at Col Holy Cross College some years ago. He went to George Mason, got his PhD, and he teaches at San Jose State. And I think his dissertation was on a, a sort of a, a historical study of private law enforcement. And so uh, there are many, many instances of uh, private law enforcement that, that didn't work out that way. That didn't turn into some sort of tyranny like this, like like government law enforcement has, in fact, done. And so you know, this is something that needs to be studied uh, historically do rather than theorized over. What's that? I think Walter's going to do this after Yeah, maybe Walter Block. I think his talk might, might cover this in, uh, on privatization. And uh, there was also an article in the Journal of Libertarian Studies probably 15 years ago or so by uh, Terry Anderson. And the, the title is called The Not-So-Wild Wild West. And it was about how in the American West, when it was first being settled, it was mostly private law enforcement. It was before the governments were set up. And it was really very peaceful. Uh, the, the, the movies, the cowboy and Indian movies that, that you see, everybody's shooting everybody all the time. That's, that's not true. It, didn't, it wasn't like that. Where the real violence came in the American West was when after the American Civil War, the U.S. government decided uh, the very next thing it was going to do was to uh, uh, commence a campaign of genocide against the Plains Indians to make way for the railroads, the government subsidized railroads. And it spent 25 years killing or imprisoning every last Indian on the American Plains. And that's where the violence came in. If you read about this, there were uh, arm, uh, army divisions with cannon and machine guns who had come upon an Indian village with women and children and just kill everybody, uh, even the animals. So that if anybody did survive, they would starve, there wouldn't be animals there. And so if you're talking about violence, that's where the violence was in the American West. But this is something that needs to be studied, uh, not, not theorized about. But Walter, uh, yeah, Walter Block will talk about that. I think we're out of time. It's time to put on the feed bag out there in the, uh, the lecture. <laughs>